Welcome. I'm Bill Schlesinger, president of the Cary Institute. I'm certainly glad to welcome you all back here tonight uh, in preparation for uh, both the final game of the World Series and uh, a snowstorm of pending. But uh, we have more important things to do, which is to think about the future of our planet. When uh, Bill Frazier first went down to Palmer Station in Antarctica some 30 years ago started studying at the Delhi Penguins. I don't think anybody really knew what was about to unfold in terms of the story of global change, particularly climate change. On the population of uh, charismatic species right there uh, that uh, I've had the privilege of seeing uh, up close and personal uh, and there's probably nothing cuter in the environment than the Delhi Penguin. Uh, but uh, his work has become a real uh, benchmark of the climate change that is impacting uh, the planet globally and is seen uh, down there on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, tonight we're very pleased to have Fen Montaigne here uh, to tell us about uh, Fraser's Penguins. Uh, he is the author of a new book called Fraser's Penguins, A Journey to the Future in, our, in, in Antarctica. Uh, and we're putting this on, as we sometimes do, with the Merritt Bookstore, which will have uh, these books available up front uh, afterwards for those of you that might want to purchase a copy. Maybe you can get an autograph by the author who's with us tonight. Uh, Fenn was uh, awarded uh, a Guggenheim Fellowship to go down to Antarctica uh, and write a book uh, staying at Palmer Station about Fraser's Penguins and to see uh, the work being done at Palmer Station. Uh, on climate change and ecosystems in Antarctica. Uh, some of you have, may, have also seen his work in the New Yorker, National Geographic, Smithsonian, a wide variety of uh, outlets uh, in which he's chronicled uh, various environmental uh, changes and uh, environmental issues uh, before us. Uh, his story tonight will be of warming climate, melting ice, uh, impacts on the Adelie penguin, what to expect in its future and our future, and one thing. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a booty voice even without a microphone, um, so I'm sure we'll be fine. I want to thank Bill for, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure. I, even though I lived in New York City and lived for many years in Westchester County, I've never been up. Uh, to Millbrook before, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank Pam Freeman for, for putting uh, all this, uh, to you, helping put this together tonight, and also one of the scientists here, Ken Schmidt, who uh, I believe uh, first suggested that uh, perhaps uh, uh, people here might be interested in hearing a bit about penguins in Antarctica. So, uh, and I want to thank you for coming. I realize there's another important bird that's being featured tonight. That would be the St. Louis Cardinals. I'm a big baseball fan, a big Cardinal fan, so I'm going to try and get you guys out here a little after 8, so those of you who are interested can go watch the game. The game last night was one of the great World Series games in, in recent decades. Um, Bill did a, a, a very good job of sort of explaining uh, what I was doing in Antarctica and what this book was about which is basically, uh, I, I try in the book to tell the story of this uh, uh, scientist, Bill Frazier, uh, who as a graduate student first went down to Antarctica in 1974 from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he did his PhD thesis on kelp gulls, which is a kind of seagull. Uh, as Bill said, neither he nor almost anyone else was even thinking about global warming. In fact, you might remember Later in the 1980s, some very misinformed scientists and journalists were talking about impending global cooling, which now looks uh, pretty ridiculous. But uh, Bill and his mentor there, a guy named Dave Parmalee, uh, started putting together a great data set of, uh, uh, on various seabirds there. And basically, the data set's strength involves something as simple as counting birds. And basically, Bill and his colleagues, since uh, the early to mid 1970s have been censusing these penguin colonies within about 15 miles of Palmer Station, which is a little U.S. scientific base on the Antarctic Peninsula. I'm going to show you pictures of all this. 
For those of you who uh, are somewhat familiar with Antarctica, um, the peninsula is that 1,000 mile finger of land that juts up towards the southern tip of South America. Uh, these beautiful mountains that you see um, right here are really an extension of the Andes and uh, formed by tectonic forces, uplift, and all that. Uh, so basically, Palmer Station is a 40-person station on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the warmest part of Antarctica. And Bill Fraser has been there off and on for the last 35, 36 years, and has chronicled these very dramatic changes in the bird populations there. Most notably, this marvelous bird, the Adelie penguin. Uh, this is the classic tuxedo penguin of all cartoons. This penguin and the equally famous emperor penguin, which you probably remember from the movie The March of the Penguins, are the two truly polar, and when you talk polar with penguin, that means only the, the South Pole. These are the two truly Antarctic penguin species, meaning they breed and reside exclusively on the Antarctic continent. There are other species that, that breed further north, like the Gentoo and, and the Chinstrap, but the Adelie, which comes up to about your knee, and the Emperor, which comes up to about your hip, uh, and the Emperor weighs 80 pounds, the Adelie weighs about 9 or 10 pounds. They are the great Antarctic penguins. And the thing they have in common, among many things, uh, is they are sea ice dependent. And uh, I won't go into why the emperors are that way, but the Adelis are sea ice dependent because in the winter, they uh, hang out on the ice uh, that freezes on the top of the southern ocean that surrounds Antarctica, and they use that sea ice as a feeding platform all winter long to feed. And basically, what has happened in short in terms of climate change, and I don't want to belabor the climate change issue here. It's, of course, paramount. Uh, but I, I find with audiences, um, when one talks about penguins and the beauty of Antarctica and Ernest Shackleton, uh, I think it's a more appealing talk. Uh, climate change is a very daunting subject, uh, one that we're not doing a good job of tackling, and I just want to give you a sense of how it's affecting this, this one species. But anyway, these penguins uh, have lived in an environment where since 1950, and, and we know this because the British were there at a station called Faraday, and have been keeping very accurate records for the last 60 whatever years that is. Since 1950, winter air temperatures on the northwestern Antarctic Peninsula, where Bill Fraser did his work, or does his work, have gone up 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Year-round temperatures about 6 degrees Fahrenheit. And equally importantly, though less seemingly dramatic, sea temperatures have risen by a degree or two Fahrenheit, which has a big impact. And what this means is that the apron of sea ice that forms around Antarctica every winter uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula area now is there are three fewer months of sea ice a year because of this warming. And because of this rapid contraction in the duration of sea ice, these penguins are not doing well at all. Their numbers have plummeted about 9% in the whole region. And anyway, I'm going to tell you about that, but again, I don't want to dwell on it. I want to convey, first of all, this extraordinary continent. Uh, I've traveled to a lot of places, but there's something in me, because I love high latitudes, so just passionately reacted to Antarctica. Now, I'm not talking about the South Pole, which is this vast ice desert, uh, 9,000 feet high, sitting atop 15,000 feet of ice. I'm talking the Antarctic Peninsula, which is this incredible landscape of these beautiful glaciated mountains plunging right into the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Ocean is teeming with penguins and, and seals, and not so many whales because of the years of whaling, but there you still see enough whales. And it's, it's truly the most beautiful landscape I've ever seen in my life, in, in, in part because it's, it's unearthly. It is truly an unearthly kind of beauty, and it, it, it touches all the explorers who go there and all the tourists who go there, if the, one gets the sense, and I'll show you some pictures later, of just this, this the, of how grand uh, uh, the landscape and vast it is and how insignificant we are. And in this landscape uh, live the Adelie penguins. Uh, here's an Adelie. Uh, I like this shot uh, because it, it, it shows an Adelie uh, in full kind of morning alarm mode. I got too close to it. 
And uh, you can see, look, it's hackles arrays, just like a cat's would be. And it's giving me this sort of Google-eyed, wall-eyed stare telling me to back off, which I did. Um, this is Bill Frazier. Uh, he's uh, about 60. Uh, when he's not in Antarctica, he lives in Montana. He's a real outdoorsman. He kills, uh, you know, he shoots, good Lord, elk, antelope, deer, and basically he and his wife uh, live off uh, uh, the land, so to speak. Um, great guy, military veteran, takes terrific care of his team. And I first went down there for National Geographic for a month to do a cover story on global warming and was so taken with the place and with Bill and his work. And I thought, well, if I could get back there for the entire birding season, if you will, from October through March, be a member of his team and tell the story chronologically of that season and through that the story of Bill and the impact of global warming on penguins, I thought it would be a great book. And thanks to the National Science Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, I managed to pull that off, and I worked as a, an unpaid member of Bill Frazier's uh, burning team. But here's Bill doing the, the simple work that has given him this great data set, and that's he's got a little clicker in one hand, and he's just counting penguins. He's counting adults, he's counting chicks. They also do much more sophisticated work. But basically, Bill found himself in the midst of one of the most rapidly warming regions on Earth. And as this was becoming clear, um, a bunch of scientists from various universities uh, got funding from the US government, and they are now conducting this exhaustive, really important study called the Long-Term Ecolo Ecological Research Program, studying the entire impact of this rapid warming on the whole Antarctic Peninsula, everything from the chemistry of the ocean to uh, these top predators, such as penguins. Um, this is a NASA map uh, showing the continent of Antarctica. Um, it's got a little temperature uh, twist to it, which I'll tell you in a second about. But Antarctica is unique uh, as a polar region uh, because unlike the Arctic, Antarctica is a giant continent surrounded by water, completely surrounded by the Southern Ocean. Uh, Antarctica is one and a half times the size of the U.S., including Alaska. It is composed almost entirely of ice. 90% of the planet's ice is right there. And it is truly up to three miles thick in places. Uh, the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth was recorded over here in East Antarctica by the, so the then Soviet base, Vostok, I think in 1984, minus 126 degrees, okay? <laughs> so it gets cold. And as Robert Falcon Scott and Roald Amundsen, who raced to the South Pole in 1911 and 1912, discovered, it's windy, it's indescribably brutal conditions. But, um, and the Arctic, by contrast, and the reason it's much warmer uh, at the North Pole, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continental land masses, and that has a huge moderating influence. In fact, the interesting sort of geologically, um, about 30 million years ago, as the great southern supercontinent Gondwana was breaking apart into South America, into Africa, Australia, uh, Antarctica, Antarctica dropped to the bottom of the planet. And over recent millions of years, given its isolation by the Southern Ocean and given its the fact that it was out of the, you know, the, the warmest rays of the sun, it became this gigantic uh, dome of ice. Now, were all of this ice to melt, which is not going to happen in for many, 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 many thousands of years, it hopefully never happened, global sea levels would go up about 250 feet. That would inundate three quarters, two thirds of the inhabited world. So we don't want that to happen. Now, just uh, a little bit about how Antarctica is warming. This is warming very rapidly up here, but it's also warming here, not as rapidly up here. This. NASA map, it's complicated, it shows sort of rate of change. But the fact is that these are the trans-Antarctic mountains. There's the South Pole. This is East Antarctica. This is West Antarctica. And this whole West Antarctic region is warming rather rapidly. And the reason that's of concern is that what's happening is that these glaciers that flow into the Southern Ocean and these ice sheets are starting, starting to flow more rapidly into the, into the Southern Ocean. And um, if all of the West Antarctic region were to melt, uh, which is not out of the realm of possibility in the next, say, 500 years, 
sea levels would rise about 16 feet globally. So it's bye-bye Miami, bye-bye my beloved beach town of Avalon, New Jersey. Uh, so, I mean, among the many reasons we should care about uh, climate change is, uh, is sea level rise. Um, this world of ice, I just want to flash a few pictures here. This is a big iceberg, not really that big by Antarctic standards. These are Adelie penguins kind of hitching a ride on it. And one thing I've never been able to figure out is how these 18, 20 inch penguins made it up this sheer 12 foot wall. I, I, I don't know, maybe there was like a slide on the back. But I just want to give you a sense of some of the, just this beautiful sort of seascape. You can see the color. Um, how many of you have ever seen an iceberg? Oh my God, how many of you have been to Antarctica? Wow, how many to the Arctic? Oh, I'm very, this is a very impressive group. Uh, well, you probably know that the reason, and I don't understand all the physics and the optics, but the reason you get this beautiful celestial blue in an iceberg is because of the compaction of all the snow and ice over millennia, and it squeezes out the air bubbles, and for reasons I don't fully understand, optically you get that, that beautiful color. Here you've got, I love this, I just love this iceberg. It's got these little golf ball dimples. And we would knock off chunks of this ice or just pick it right out of the Southern Ocean, put it in our little rubber Zodiac boat, and take it back to the station and bring it up to the bar. And I'm telling you, whiskey over like 10,000-year-old iceberg ice is uh, <laughs> never tasted so good. By the way, the conditions in which we lived at this U.S. science station were hardly like those that Ernest Shackleton suffered. We had great cooks, we had warm beds, we had a bar, um, and the scientists worked hard, but uh, the U.S. government is, is taking good care of people. Here are just a few more ice pictures. These, uh, those of you, I, I realize now I'm dealing with a pretty savvy ice crowd here, so, but you may know that these are called tabular icebergs, and as those of you who know something about Antarctica realize, there is so much ice slowly streaming off the continent that some of that ice goes out over the Southern Ocean and forms these big ice shelves. Now this, this is nothing, but the granddaddy ice shelf is the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, which is the region where Shackleton and all the early explorers, uh, that's how they tried to make it to the South Pole. Shackleton, by the way, was eventually marooned not far from where we were, but he made an unsuccessful attempt at the South Pole, I believe, in 1908 on the Nimrod expedition, got within to about 180 miles and realized he either was going to uh, die getting there or turn back, and he, he turned back. But anyway, these gigantic ice shelves float out on the ocean, and then from time to time, pieces of them break off, and you get these big tabular icebergs. This one's probably... I don't know, two, three, four city blocks, it's hard to tell. Um, one other consequence of global warming along the western Antarctic Peninsula, which is the part that's really warming, the really cold parts of Antarctica are still way too cold to be feeling the heat at this point. It's more the peninsula, the exposed part. Uh, but about nine ice shelves uh, have uh, fully or partially disintegrated over the last 50 years because of warming. You might have heard of the Larsen B ice shelf, which was in the Weddell Sea where Shackleton was. At one point, it was as large as Massachusetts. Then it had a number of breakup events. Then in the late summer of, I believe, 2005, the remnant portion of the Larsen ice B, uh, B ice shelf, um, which was the size of Rhode Island, after a very, very warm summer, developed millions of little melt ponds on its surface. And those that melting water worked its way through the crevasses in the ice shelf and literally overnight. And the scientists watching satellite photos at the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado, were blown away by this. Literally, one day they got a satellite picture showing an intact Lawrence of the ice shelf. A couple of days later, it had shattered into billions of pieces. So that's gone. I mean, this was a fixture for, well, at least 12,000 years. Um, here's just a typical scene. This, I believe, is Mount Francais, about 5,000 feet high. Uh, here in the foreground, you see what is known as brash ice, which is nothing more than little chunks of glaciers. Here was when we arrived in late October. This is Little Palmer Station, this little tiny outpost kind of clean to this world of ice. Um, and uh, you can see the remnants of the winter sea ice uh, breaking up here. Uh, 
And I just want to, this landscape is it, it, impossible to convey, even if you're a good photographer, and I'm not a good photographer, but this is, I took in no, early November from the top of the glacier behind the station. And these mountains are probably 16, 18 miles away. They're three, four, five thousand feet high. This is sea ice in the middle ground. And as I stood in the glacier and looked south on a clear night, I could see mountains 120 miles away, partly because they were so high, but also because the atmosphere was so clear. I just want to read you a couple of quotes. Um, people have had such difficulty conveying the enormity of this landscape. And I, here are just a few quotes from some, some of the early explorers. One of Roald Amundsen's men, and Amundsen was the first guy to the South Pole, he beat Robert Falcon Scott, who, as you probably know, he and uh, four of his men died on the way back. Um, this lieutenant uh, in Amundsen's uh, expedition said, one's dear self becomes so miserably small in these mighty surroundings. And Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who was the greatest, earliest American explorer of Antarctica, said, there was great beauty here in the way that things which are also terrible can be beautiful. And there is something truly, to use the grossly over, overused word that my daughter has employed, there is something truly awesome about this landscape. I mean, that is what the word was meant to describe. And then you have these beautiful clear days, but believe me, if you're in a, a ship, even a modern ship with sonar and reinforced steel hulls, and you come into the Antarctic Peninsula, as I did the first time in 2004, on a gloomy, snowy day, and all you see are the base, is the base of these mountains, and, and you just can't imagine what it was like for these explorers, like a, a James Cook, who, who circumnavigated Antarctica twice in the 1770s and 80s, how terrifying it must have been. And uh, one of Scott's men said, uh, Edgar Evans, and I think he's one of the ones who died on the way back from the pole, he said, to me, those peaks always will and always did represent silent defiance. There were times when they made me shudder. And it's that kind of landscape, and it's completely indifferent to you. And, and you make one mistake down there, and you're dead. And, and that's why the National Science Foundation is very careful not to let anyone, uh, these science teams make mistakes. If the wind's blowing more than 25 miles an hour, you can't go out the boat. They have a whole list of restrictions, which actually in this environment makes sense. So let me, uh, mindful that the cardinals are, are, are also on, on, on the screen tonight to an extent. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about these Adelis, who are remarkable creatures. First of all, they're remarkable in that they're so tiny, really, you know, knee high, which is pretty big for a bird. Uh, but, and they survive in this, what would be considered a grossly inhospitable climate to almost any other bird. Uh, they have, what you're seeing here is this was actually exactly uh, on, on this day, I think it was like the 28th of October when I was down there, a couple days before Halloween. And what, what happens in the early season is that these penguins uh, migrate back to their home colonies where they were hatched out, uh, just like salmon go back to their native stream. It's quite something. Uh, generally on the Antarctic Peninsula, they'll travel two, three hundred miles to their wintering grounds. But a, uh, an American penguin biologist named Richard Penny in 1961 wanted to test the homing ability of the Adelie penguins. So what he did is he got five male non-breeding Adelie penguins, he stuffed them in a burlap sack he, on the eastern side of Antarctica. He flew them 2,000 miles to the Ross Sea, took them out of the burlap sack, put aluminum flipper bands on them, and let them go. Nine months later, this is truly incredible, three of the five made it 2,000 miles back to their colonies. Now, they didn't fly 2,000 miles. They don't fly. Penguins don't fly. They were flown there, and they, they, they made it back. It, it's quite an amazing thing. So they come back in the spring. The snow is quite deep on the islands. They basically, as I said, Antarctica is all ice, but there is uh, snow-free territory at peak summer on the islands off of Antarctica and on a thin strip of land in some places on the Antarctic coast. So they come back, they hang out, and they're waiting for the snow to melt so they can build their nests with pebbles. Now, what's interesting, and I forget, when the March of the Penguins came out, 
the, the, some, I forget what group of moralists was wondering if penguins were monogamous or something. There was a big debate about that. I don't know how this is. The fact is, they are kind of serially monogamous. Uh, if a pair comes back, and they'll come back to within 10 or 15 feet of each other, if they recognize each other, and they recognize each other by voice, they have these very complex voice boxes, a male and a female, if they mate in the previous year, will almost always, like 90% of the time, take off together and mate again. If, and there's a very high mortality rate, because it's a rough neighborhood down there, and they perish from starvation, etc. If one of the mates does not come back, the other will wait a while and then take up with a different mate. And the biggest fights that biologists like Richard Penny, who again put flipper bands and marked penguins, the biggest fights in the colonies tend to be when a male comes back, doesn't find its previous mate, takes up with a new female, and then the original female comes back. And then there tends to be a big fight. And these fights are quite something. I'm talking, they pound each other with their flippers. It sounds like a carpet being beaten. They peck each other. And another thing to strike, there's so many things about these penguins, even because of the birds, but they kind of reminded me of my golden retriever. You would see a penguin get beaten up in a fight, and it would stumble out of the colony, and it would do just what my dog does when he is hurt or hears a loud voice, and they, they shake their head like this, like, whoa, that was really bad. <laughs> so um, anyway, so they come back, they hang out, they wait for the, the, the snow to melt. Now, I, again, I'm really a bad photographer. I'm, I'm a journalist, a writer. But it just, first of the landscape, I mean, look at this landscape. And this goes down, as I said, another 150 <coughs> miles in the direction of the South Pole. Here's the ocean. And here they are, early season. You can see already um, there's been some mating here. They've laid some eggs. Here you see a male, and it's usually the male taking a pebble as a gift for a female. Um, one of Scott's men, a, a, a physician named Murray Levick, in 19, whatever year it was, 10 or whatever, um, studied the Delhi penguins and on the shores of the Ross Sea. And there's a tremendous amount of thieving among the nests. You know, the like, penguin will build a nest, neighbor will come take one of his pebbles or two of his pebbles. So the physician, Murray Levick, covered a bunch of pebbles in colored, different colored claws, put them in a spot in the penguin colony, and within a few days, those penguins had been distributed or stolen from nest to nest, and the colored uh, pebbles were just everywhere in the colony because of the, of the uh, pebble thievery. Um, Here's just another early early season scene. The penguins just they're, it's kind of peaceful. They 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 haven't quite begun their mating. These are two members of Bill's team. Uh, again, a colony right there. I mean, and to work in this environment every day was so extraordinary. I mean, imagine you just this is your office. And uh, I came back from Antarctica after five months there, and. Uh, I, I like, could hardly go outside. I, I, I went to my daughter's sports games. I fixed meals and kind of hold up like some shell-shocked uh, um, person in the house until I could get used to being back in, uh, in civilization. Here is, they have a great homing ability, these penguins, but here's a penguin that missed its mark. He came on the wrong side of this glacier called the Mar Ice Piedmont. And what you see here is the most effective way for them to travel on snow is on their bellies. They toboggan. And you can see the little knife marks of their flippers where they were pushing themselves along. Uh, but as you know, if you've been to Antarctica or know anything about penguins, they are a bit awkward on land. And their real medium is the sea. They are amazing swimmers. They have this incredible hydrodynamic body. In fact, the first explorers, you know, Vasco da Gama, the other people in the 15, 1600s who encountered penguins in South America off the coast of of South Africa weren't were entirely sure if these were birds or fish. And that was sort of fitting, because they are really almost fish-like. Here's Jen Bloom, a member of the team. Early in the season, there's a lot of sea ice. And uh, normally, we didn't wear these full immersion suits, uh, but we did when the sea ice was thick in case you know, something happened. Here's a view of the Bill's team uh, passing a, a sort of decaying iceberg. There's a big old elephant seal. Uh, wonderful creatures, a bit disgusting when they wallow on land, uh, but uh, they're the deepest diving seal on Earth. They get to be about a ton. Um, here you see 
early on, uh, this is a, a small penguin colony. You see these guys here are what is, is they're making doing what's called the ecstatic display. And that's a both a territorial and to a certain degree a mating call where they fill up their lungs with air. You can see this guy right here has really got a full lungful. And they flap their flippers and then they point their uh, beak skyward and then they go, I can't, I won't even try to imitate it. They let out this sound that it kind of sounds like bagpipes. In fact, there's a funny bagpipe story in Penguins. When Shackleton was marooned in 1914-15 uh, in the Waddell Sea, not far from here, uh, and if you recall the story of the Endurance, his ship for a time was totally locked in the ice, for many months actually. And in the beginning, as they were locked in the ice, a small group of penguins walked up to the ship. You know, Adelis, and they wobbled up and, you know, kind of stared at the ship. And so one of the men uh, started, pulled out his banjo and started playing It's a Long Way from Tipperary. And Shackleton reports that the penguins seemed to be pleased by the sound of the banjo and stood there. And then one of the few Scottish members of the Shackleton expedition went down below decks, brought up his bagpipe, and started playing the bagpipe, whereupon, according to Frank Hurley, the expedition photographer, the penguins plunged in terror into the sea. So they, they sound like a bagpipe sometimes, but they, they don't like the sound. Again, just another sort of beautiful early season scene. Here are two Adelis mating. Um, I'm not an ornithologist, but I'm told that uh, many, most birds, uh, Ken, do they all do the cloacal kiss? Is that? Many. What's that? Many. Many. So penguins, uh, the, the male is on top of the female, and it's a very delicate and very brief uh, mating session. And their, their beaks kind of quiver. The female, as you can see, lifts her beaks up. And the two beaks are quivering. They fan their tail feathers. <clears throat> their genitalia or cloaca touch. And that's how they mate. And the Adelis are very close in size, the males and females. And the one sure way during the mating season to tell males from females is that the females all have muddy uh, flipper prints on their, <laughs> not flipper prints, uh, what do you call them? Feet print, footprints on their backs. So uh, here's another male on the right bringing a, a, you can see they make these very nifty nests. Uh, they have these brood sacks, which I guess many birds have. I, 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 I'm not an ornithologist. But it's this, uh, an opening in their, their mark, their feathers are incredible. They're so dense, they're laid on top of each other like a shingle roof. I mean, they're insulated amazingly. But uh, studies have been done that even on the coldest ground in much colder parts of Antarctica, a penguin can keep two eggs in its brood sac, incubating at like a steady 85, I forget, 80 something degree temperature. It's quite something. And as you recall, the emperors, the males actually incubate the, uh, I believe it's one egg or two, I forget, on, the, on the, their, their feet. So um, here, just a, a typical scene. The colonies, unlike the March of the Penguins, which was this silent, beautiful, white world of ice, I'll show you some pictures later. Adelie penguin colonies and colonies in high summer are these guano-filled, stinking uh, messes. And, and the penguins coming out of the colonies into the sea to feed tend to be smeared in guano. And the ones going back to the colonies after having filled their bellies with krill, which is a shrimp-like creature or fish, are beautiful sort of satiny white. Here you see a couple of penguins. There's a debate about how smart penguins are. Um, I mean, they are, after all, only birds. But uh, here they're smart enough to, to walk in the trail of an, uh, uh, that was compacted by an elephant seal. So I also have to say, just given the most famous thing about penguins, I want to read you one funny line from one of the great ornithologists of all time, Robert Cushman Murphy, who did a lot of work in the Southern Ocean. Uh, talking about this kind of, what's the word, this busy kind of pompous air that the penguins have. And he wrote, their business-like air was intensely ludicrous. One could imagine them saying in the fussiest manner, can't stop now, much too busy, much too busy. So, and they kind of look like that. Um, and the amazing thing about these birds is they'll kind of walk right up to you. Like right up to me. I'm six foot two, they kind of look at you, you know, walk on past. But if you get too close to them, if you get in their, their sort of 
what's the word you use in the inner space, um, they will, you know, attack no matter how big you are. I had to, I, I, I made sure down there I did no work that would do any harm to any bird. So they had me doing the simplest chores like counting penguins. But from time to time I would go collect an egg from a nest and deliver it to them to be weighed and measured. And I remember I was walking to collect an egg from one nest and this Delhi penguin came up to me, like absolutely no hesitation, walked right up and jabbed me with its beak right through like three layers of clothing, broke the skin, hurt like hell. They, I mean, they are, they are fearless. They're very, you know, they're lovable creatures, although they're very irascible. You know, they live, look how closely spaced their nests are. And if you get in another penguin space, if one penguin gets in another space, um, you will be promptly uh, thrashed. Here you see um, one of the things I loved about watching the colonies was the nest exchange. So let's say the female was out feeding, the male was incubating the egg. And by the way, after the, when they migrate, when they, when they mate, when they build their nest, everybody fasts, male and female. As soon as the female lays the egg, I think it just stays for about a month. She goes out and feeds for a week or so in the Southern Ocean while the male does the incubation. And then let's say this is the male. He's coming back. He's clean as can be. And he has to kind of persuade the partner to get off the nest, which is an often difficult thing to do. It's like the one incubating the eggs, usually a pair of eggs, often seems reluctant to get off. And so they talk to each other and they, they communicate. And I don't know quite what they're saying, but... Um, and here's a nice time of year. This is December. It's warming up. The temperatures there, as those of you who've been to Antarctica in the summer know, on the peninsula can be quite warm. I mean, most days were in the 30s. We had one day there that was 52.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which is way too warm. Um, but this is a nice warm day. And this is the only time the colonies are quiet. The, the penguins are lying down. It's sunny. They're, they're incubating the eggs. So it's, it's a very nice time. And here you see. Uh, the first chicks come out about the new year, very cute, very downy, and for two weeks they are utterly dependent on their parents. They are dependent because they need the warmth of the brood patch, uh, but they also are dependent because the main predator of penguins in Antarctica, which is either the south polar skua or the brown skua, will devour them instantly if they wander six inches away from uh, their mother or father. Here you see, actually, one of those warm days, that's a penguin panting. You can see a chick under here. But that was one, one of those really warm days. And they release heat uh, primarily through their feet, through panting, I also think through their flippers. Um, and those of you, most of you probably know, they are, the chicks are fed by the regurgitation of krill or fish. And uh, the, the chicks grow at this rate three ounces a day, as much as three ounces a day, which for a nine pound bird is, is quite something. Uh, and at this point, you've still got one penguin with the chicks, one out uh, feeding. And here, probably these chicks are 10 days old. You can see still clinging closely to their parents. Uh, just to give you a sense of what Bill and his team do, in addition to counting penguins and other seabirds, they have an amazing data set. For those of you who are scientists, you know, a data set in one area extending back nearly four decades is really a great data set, particularly in the face of such rapid change. And by the way, um, the numbers of penguins in Bill's study area have gone down from 30 to 35,000 pairs. So let's say 70, 65 to 70,000 total birds to about 10,000 total birds. That's quite, and, and that drop is mirrored everywhere along the, uh, the northwestern Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, so in addition to counting birds, Bill right here is about to grab this guy, who's not the least bit happy. In fact, Bill and his team are identifiable in many ways. One is they smell because they're handling birds all day and they stink of guano. Uh, the second is their hands and wrists are like chewed to bits by penguin beaks, south polar skua beaks, uh, southern giant petrel beaks, and um, here you see Bill, oh, Bill's about to grab this guy, uh, and Bill is amazing at this. I mean, first of all, it is so hard. This thing is pecking you, and he reaches in. One quick grab, he gets one flipper, grabs the other flipper, carries the bird back like this to one of the fellow bird team members, who then, in this case, puts on this pretty simple uh, radio transmitter. And what that does, every time that penguin goes into the ocean, 
it, that transmitter is going to stop sending a signal. Every time it comes out of the ocean, it retransmits. So Bill has great data over the years about how long uh, these foraging trips of these penguins are and what he's finding as the krill, which I'm going to talk about, become less, become more scarce in the region, the, the, the duration of their foraging trips is increasing. He also puts satellite tags on numerous seabirds there, uh, including Adelis, to see where they're foraging, where they're migrating, etc. So he does that. Uh, this is a marvelous bird uh, called a southern giant petrel, big thing. I'm talking bigger than a goose. Uh, this bird was hated by the sailors in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was believed that if a sailor went overboard, a southern giant petrel, and allegedly this was observed, would peck the sailor's eyes out as it was drowning and then feed off the sailor's body. So this was a despised bird. The early British researchers, not so early, in the 1940s and 50s, worked with these birds by taking a forked stick, like in the Falkland Islands, and instead of trying to band them sort of gently, they would they would put the forked stick over the petrel's neck and sort of hold it down. Um, what the, the point of all this is that Bill and his second wife, Bill's original wife, kind of got tired of having a husband who was gone six months a year. In fact, I have an anecdote in the book um, in which Bill's about to take off for another six-month tour of duty in Antarctica, and one of his daughters comes up to, to um, uh, Bill's wife and says, you know, Mommy, well, you know, why is Daddy going away again? And, and the wife said something to the effect, because your daddy loves penguins more than he loves you. <laughs> so you know that's a marriage that's in some difficulty. Anyway, here's his wife split up and Bill remarried uh, uh, another bird biologist named Donna Patterson. But Bill and Donna, over 15 years, have habit habituated an entire colony of these believed to be fearsome southern giant petrels to their presence. And what that means is, Bill is able and his wife and the team members to go right up to a petrel, insinuate his hand under the petrel's uh, torso, pull an egg out, weigh an egg, measure an egg, do the same thing with these adorable chicks. Uh, here you can see Bill doing the same thing. Look at that. That's a fearsome predator, a south polar skua, and he's habituated a group of those to his presence. And this has given Bill an amazing ability to band, study, weigh, and track the health of these bird populations. And again, the birds like the uh, south polar skua, uh, which is dependent on eating a fish called an Antarctic sea silverfish, whose life history is intimately intertwined with sea ice. As the sea ice declines, silverfish have basically vacated the area, and these birds are not doing so well either. But anyway, uh, so there's a, a cute little south polar skua chick, and here you can see a chick, what's known as pipping its way out of the egg with its, its egg tooth. There's Bill measuring the beak of a little chick, and the mother just sits there going, rank, 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 sort of. However, not all skuas are habituated. <laughs> And this is a highly unhabituated skua. And uh, I actually, I saw it, and there was a Canadian documentary team filming Bill as he did this. There was a group of wild skuas on an island called Dream Island. And these skuas were so wild, Bill hadn't been able to catch them, and he wanted to ban them. And uh, it was amazing to watch, and again, this is on film. He, what he did to finally get the skua come within range so he could grab it and ban it is he took the skua's chick. He leaned over the chick and he started like throwing bits of moss up into the air. And the adult was nearby and getting very agitated. So the adult started swooping back and forth over Bill's head. And Bill reached up literally and grabbed it by both legs out of the air, quickly brought its wings into its torso so the wings wouldn't break, and, and banded the thing. It was quite incredible. He's, he's very skilled working with these creatures. These are elephant seals, with creatures Bill's not too fond of because they will from time to time stampede through the colonies and if the chicks are small or, the, or they're only eggs, they will crush the eggs and the chicks. Here you see the main uh, marine predator of Adelie penguins. These are leopard seals. This is a really small one. This is probably eight feet long. Uh, in the first week of the season, we were in a zodiac boat traveling between two islands and this leopard seal, which had to be almost to the maximum extent of a leopard seal, 
was a female. He was 12, about 12 feet long. It must have weighed over, I don't know, about 1,000 pounds, and it just circled our boat. And these things are incredible penguin killing machines. Shackleton's men shot a big female leopard seal to eat it, because as you know, they had to live off the land. And they cut open its stomach. It had the remains of 18 penguins in it. I mean, and they're amazing creatures. Also ice dependent. They always hang out in ice flows. And it's kind of unclear how they're doing. Uh, no one has really studied them that much. And this is the reason that the Antarctic Peninsula was discovered. These critters are fur seals. Uh, in 1821, uh, a British officer was blown off course going around Cape Horn and blown down. It was the first guy to see Antarctica. People actually didn't believe there was a landmass there. You know, James Cook never actually saw the continent. He just saw the ice coming off of the continent. So the next year, uh, fur sealers actually went down, and the peninsula was discovered really because the fur sealers wanted these furs, mainly for the market in China. They were highly prized, the skins of the seals. There were millions of uh, fur seals uh, killed in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And in five years, a half a million fur seals on the northern Antarctic Peninsula were wiped out. Virtually the entire population was extirpated in five years from 1821 to 1825. But they're coming back now. They're, for that fact, coming back quite well. But these are a sub-Antarctic creature, really. And they're moving in in great numbers because the region is warming. Uh, here, talking about that squalor, um, you see this is just about at the point where the chicks are getting big enough and the parents are going to leave. And let me tell you, this smell with all this guano is not pleasant. And here, you see a very interesting phase of the, the chicks' lives. In about two to three weeks, the adults can no longer continue to feed both chicks. So both adults start to go out simultaneously to get food. And they leave the chicks in what are known as creches, just like the manger, the creche. And you can see how scruffy the chicks begin to look. I mean, look at this guy with kind of a mullet hairdo. You get these kind of English bears. But they're, just, they're just losing their down. Um, and um, they were somewhat rem reminiscent of, 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 of teenagers for a number of reasons. Um, they hung out in packs, they looked scruffy, they were constantly wheedling their parents for, for food. Um, and here, oh, this is great. This is like what I call my Western front shot. I mean, this is a typical penguin colony about January 15th. I mean, the adults are all, we're probably a little later in January, the adults are mostly out feeding. And here are all the scruffy, uh, shedding uh, uh, chicks. And here, again, that teenager analogy, here are two chicks chasing after an adult begging for food. Uh, now, also, by identifying the chicks by voice, the, a, a chick might come up to an adult, and the adult will, in essence, query the chick to see if it's its own. It will send out a verbal signal, make a call, and if that chick you know, sends back the wrong call and it's not its own chick identifiable by voice, Generally, the adult will not feed uh, the chick. So how do the harried and beleaguered Adeli parents deal with uh, these obnoxious teenage uh, chicks? Well, what they finally do is that about 50 days after the chicks are 50 years old, the Adeli parents simply desert the colony. They leave. It's like if you were to, like, you know, throw the car keys at the kid and, like, <laughs> clean out the refrigerator and said, I am so sick of you, I'm out of here. And what they do is they go into the ocean, they feed, and then they come back. These are all adults, beautiful sort of sunset scene. Of course, down in the sun like, took like two hours to set. It was never really dark. It was just gorgeous. Um, and they hang out, they rest, and then pretty soon they're going to molt. Every year they molt they, they, after the, the taking care of their chicks and then feeding and, and beefing up, they will molt. But the chicks hang out in the colony for uh, a few days, up to a week. And after a few days, their stomachs are growling, and they're going, what the heck? No one's coming back. So the chicks instinctively wander down to the sea. And here you see a group of chicks. They have just wandered out of their colonies. They stand by the ocean looking at it like, what is this? I mean, you know, they've ne many of them have never seen the ocean from their colonies. They've never followed the parents down to the ocean. And this was a group that, after a few bold chicks dove in, this group all kind of plunged in, and then a big wave came and sort of tumbled them like bowling pins. 
and they were panicked. They sort of jumped back up on the rock here, but eventually they all went in, and uh, and it's sink or swim. And and part of the problem now is even though the experienced adults are able to cope with a decline in krill, with a decline in sea ice, with in essence uh, the fact that their environment has become much less hospitable for them, the inexperienced chicks have a much harder time with these environmental factors that, that are, are, are making it inhospitable for them. And what Bill Fraser and the other scientists in the region studying the Delhi penguins are finding is that there's very, very few chicks returning to breed. And other, the scientists would call it low recruitment. And that's the reason that the, the populations are, are plummeting. Bill estimates just from the, the sort of downward curve of the Delhi populations that in his lifetime, and let's hope Bill lives to 85 or 90, that's another 25 years, uh, Adelis could be extinct in this region of several hundred miles of northwestern Antarctica. There are still 2.5 million pairs of Adelis in Antarctica, and it'll be a long time before the, the climate warms enough in the whole continent before they go extinct. I don't think they'll ever go extinct. They've survived warming periods in the past. But different scientists predict that by the end of this century, if this kind of warming starts to warm up the colder parts of Antarctica and melt more sea ice, that Adelie populations could decline by about 50%. Um, let me quickly wrap up here. This was a very common scene. This is an island called Torgeson Island. And what's happening as this, these are two, this one and then this in the back, are two of the remaining large colonies. And what happens is that when you have a big colony, Many of the penguins are on the inside of the colony. They're not edge nests, and they're safe from predation. But as colonies shrink, and you say only have 30 pairs, virtually every nest is an edge nest. And what does that mean? That means the skuas basically wipe out every single chick, every single egg. And so climate change is pushing the Adelis in this region to the brink of extinction, local extinction. And then the skuas kind of finish them off. And here is a typical scene of an adult the last adult in the colony that probably, had given its size, had at least 50 or 100 pairs, is no longer there. Here's Bill in front of a colony uh, on Litchfield Island. These were the last two chicks and the last adult, Adelie chicks on Litchfield Island. They, uh, the adult, the next day went in to feed, and the skuas picked off those chicks in about, well, within a day, we know for a fact. Uh, and so Litchfield Island, which has had penguins on it for at least 700 years because of carbon dating the bones there, and when Bill first got there, had more than 900 pairs. Litchfield Island no longer has any Adelie penguins. Um, this is Palmer Station seen from the glacier, and in addition to these changes in the marine environment, and, and one of the most significant changes, which uh, is krill. And krill in their life cycle, these little, the, the uh, Euphalsia superbia is the Antarctic krill. It's about that big at its biggest. Uh, their life history is dependent on sea ice. The juveniles in their, in their young stage go up under the sea ice in the winter and feed in the sea ice. And they, they scrape the plankton out of the sea ice. And they're also protected from pre predators by the sea ice. As sea ice declines, a krill appear to be declining. I mean, there's some dispute about that, but the signs are that they, they are declining. So that these marine changes are being well documented by this group of US scientists and British scientists. But there are a lot of terrestrial or land changes, most notable, noticeably to the people at the station. This glacier used to come right up to the backyard of the station. It has retreated since 1965, when the US Navy first went down there to scout out the area for the station. It's retreated 1,400 feet in, what's that, 30, 40, whatever that number of years is, four or five decades. 97% uh, of the glaciers on the Western Antarctic Peninsula are in retreat. Uh, so, I mean, and, and the bad thing about when the ice shelves are melting and, and disintegrating, they act, an ice shelf is like a, a dam that holds back the glacier, slows up its move into the sea. When these ice shelves disintegrate, the glaciers really speed up their movement into the sea and dump more ice into the sea, which, of course, because they were land-based, uh, increases sea levels. 
Um, by the way, I work now at, at, as an editor at an online uh, environmental magazine called Yale Environment 360, and so I, I, you know, edit a lot of stories and write some stories about things like sea level rise. The best take among, in, I think, well-versed scientists about how much sea level is going to increase this century is somewhere between three to six feet. That is huge. I mean, that's going to inundate some barrier islands, not to mention, uh, you know, the Maldives and things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, here you see a glacier retreating, and this, this island didn't exist like five years ago. The glacier retreats, there it is. And interestingly, as the glaciers pull back, you're getting this colonization of the land by the two vascular plants that exist in Antarctica. One is a cushion plant, and one is a, a wart plant, W-O-R-T. Anyway, uh, so you're getting this, this, this land is being exposed, and it's warming because you know, the ice reflects this, the, the heat back into the atmosphere, whereas the dark earth absorbs the heat. So that, in a slight degree, is adding to the warming in Antarctica. Where it's really adding to the warming is in the Arctic. As you probably know, if you follow this, Arctic summer sea ice is on a like, roller coaster, kamikaze downward trajectory. Uh, the, as you know, the Arctic, the Northwest Passage, and the Great Northern Sea Route across Siberia, these have been open the last three years. I mean, the world's oil companies are looking at the Arctic like, ching, ching, and uh, the, the Arctic is going to be, without question, ice-free in the summer within probably two decades. I mean, it's quite something, and, and, and it's been many thousands of years that it's been ice-free. But all of that open water in the Arctic now absorbs more heat, and it creates what scientists call positive feedback, which is, in fact, a very negative thing. It's a, it's a vicious cycle of warming. Here's Bill on a glacier on Bisco Point that when he first got there 35 years ago it was scores of feet above his head. is now reduced to that. So enough about all that. I'm going to quickly wrap up. One more interesting twist to what's happening uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, and it shows you how complex the climate system is and how um, it's going to, we know the Earth is going to get warmer. We know there are going to species that are going to win and species that are going to lose. Uh, but the interaction of the climate is, is, is system, both the atmospheric and the marine currents, is very complex. Uh, sort of counterintuitively, there's more snow now. You would think, well, it's warming up. There should be less snow. No, what's happening is because less sea ice, there's more evaporation, more precipitation, and it's still sufficiently cold down there that the precipitation falls as snow. Well, you would think snow must be good for Adelie penguins there, Antarctic penguins. No, Antarctica is basically a polar desert. I mean, there is very little precipitation on the polar plateau. There's more on the, in the marine environment of the peninsula. But what happens to the Adelies? These creatures are hardwired, just like salmon, to come back to their native colonies at a certain time of year. Bill put thousands of flipper bands on Adelie penguins thinking, OK, it's getting too hot for them where they are. Uh, they'll move south in the Antarctic to colder areas. And hardly a single other penguin has turned up further south. They're basically all dying out in place. So these birds come back, like I said, late September, early October. And at a certain point, even if there's still snow on their nesting grounds, they they have to mate. They start mating. And what happens, in, and Bill is documenting this is increasing, and this is in a leading to penguin mortality, is the snow then melts, and look at these penguin eggs. Uh, and they're adult, they become an adult. They can't live in, in, in 35 degree water. Here you can see sort of touchingly a penguin is trying to fish its egg out of the pool. Uh, and you can see on the edge, these penguins are still trying to incubate. There's krill, uh, the things that are in decline. Now, basically, the winners in the warming are some penguin species like this one, the gentoo, which is a, a bigger penguin, also a lovely bird. Uh, and they uh, are sub-Antarctic. They're found as far north as the Falkland Islands. They like it warmer. They're not ice dependent. They have a much more flexible breeding schedule. So as the Adelies die out, the gentoos are moving in. So are these guys aptly named Chinstrap, also cute as can be. Uh, and they're a sub-Antarctic penguin. They're coming in. Um, and there's a Gentoo on the left with two Gentoo chicks and then the Chinstrap on the right. 
Um, and uh, here's just a very typical scene. This was like Colony 42 on Torgerson Island. When I got there in October 2005, there were like 35 or 40 nesting pairs. And within five or six, well, within five weeks of the eggs hatching out, every single uh, of those 40 nests had been decimated by skuas simply because they were all uh, edge nests. So that's sort of a more common um, scene. I, I just want to conclude with a few thoughts about global warming, which unfortunately has become a highly politicized thing. And, and to me, this, this is so uh, destructive and nonsensical. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not quite sure why some people don't believe that what 98% of the scientists on Earth are saying, the climate scientists, and what physics is a physical fact, that we are, I mean, think, just think of what we're doing to the planet now. We are taking fossil fuels that have been deposited inside the Earth over, really, hundreds of millions of years. Think of the dinosaurs, all that plant material and the, the steamy dinosaur days. We are now pulling that out at a stunningly rapid rate. And what's really frightening, as if we Americans haven't been piggish enough using fossil fuels. And believe me, I love fossil fuels. Uh, you know, I grew up in, I was born in 1952. I mean, you know, our whole society is based on fossil fuels, our prosperity. It's, they're absolutely essential for now. Um, but basically, we're now looking at China. I mean, if you, this, uh, the people are concerned about climate. When you look at the growth of China's economy and how much of that is going to be fed by coal, and China's got a lot of solar, a lot of wind, it's going to hardly make a dent. Their economy runs on coal, India's economy. We are, 200 years ago, there were 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're now just shy of 400 parts per million. Most of that CO2, which it's been proven, it's a physical fact, like if an apple falls from a tree, it goes down, not up. Most of that CO2 has been deposited since 1950, even you could say since 1970. And now we've got America still cranking it out like crazy. We've got all these rapidly developing countries, as they should, wanting to live like us. And we are now putting CO2 in the air at a mind-bogglingly rapid rate. So what are we doing? We are messing with a climate system that has basically nurtured civilization. Our current period, the Holocene, say it's 12,000 years old, has had a remarkably stable climate. And we are now poking that beast. And, you know, the, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to shift our economy. Uh, I'm hoping that bright young people are going to come up with some silver bullet technologies. I think without a doubt we're going to have to resort to geoengineering the planet at some point. I think it's going to get so hot, sea levels are going to rise so much, we're going to have to start pulling CO2 out of the air, we're going to have to start putting aerosols in the atmosphere to deflect heat. Everybody I know who, who studies this global warming issue carefully says we are so screwed if we don't do something. And, and the, key, the thing about being writing about this is and that's why I packed my book with a lot of stuff about Antarctic and exploration and penguins. I and mean, global warming is kind of in the background. You can't depress people. You have to leave people with some hope. And, and of course, there is hope. And I know there have been periods in the history where people, particularly middle-aged and older people, looked at each other and said, we are so screwed. But, and younger people don't tend to say that. And I, and I hope somehow we'll see our way clear. But. Um, you know, we've got to make this shift, and, and it goes beyond you know, personal decisions and, low, and reducing one's carbon footprint are good. I'm all for that. Uh, but we're going to need changes on a much, much larger scale, which really has to be driven by two things. One is, is, is engineering slash entrepreneurship slash science to come up with the technologies to get rid of fossil fuels. But to get to that point, and maybe this is where some of the more conservative global warming skeptics uh, take issue, you need the government, you just can't, you can't take a system totally built on fossil fuels and make that transition without government action and incentives. It's just impossible. And now, and I'm going to end on this, and happy to take any questions about penguins, 
Now you have climate activists like Bill McKibben and other really smart people coming to the realization that the concept of peak oil, peak natural gas, forget about it. Forget about it. We got enough fossil fuels to heat this country, the world up another 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, fracking, all of these unconventional and much dirtier and much more CO2 producing fossil fuels, we're just beginning to tap into these all around the world. There's plenty of coal. There's lots of oil. So people like Bill Frazier, uh, uh, Bill McKibben are going, oh my God, we thought maybe peak, peak fossil fuels would help us here. That's not going to help us. We can burn fossil fuels for the next 200 years. So somehow, we've got to make the shift. Because if we don't, uh, you know, it's going to be a very, very unpleasant uh, planet to inhabit. So that's my spiel. Uh, happy to take uh, any questions, and thank you very much. changes in the, the jet streams, in the polar vortexes. 
And kind of what's happening in Antarctica is a shift in, in these jet streams, a shift which is shifting ocean circulation patterns, and basically it's sucking all of this warm air from the South Pacific and Atlantic down over the Antarctic Peninsula. Interestingly, our warm, cold winter last year made me do, and they're still studying this, to the fact that the Arctic, particularly in the summer, is getting quite, quite warm. And so the polar, north polar vortex is changing and is dipping down a little lower, bringing colder air down to us. But last winter in the Arctic, they had unprecedented high temperatures while the changing uh, jet streams brought us really, really cold temperatures. So you can't base one season, one hot spell, one cold spell, and say, well, there is or there isn't climate change. Yes? What is happening with the ozone hole? A good question. And you know, people who study um, public opinion and how can the public be moved more about climate change, there's a guy at Yale named Tony Lyserowitz who's an expert on this. It's interesting that people who, like you, are concerned about the environment in Antarctica often conflate, or, or, or in their own minds, the ozone hole problem is the same as the global warming problem, which it's not. The ozone hole should slowly close because we've been reducing the chlorofluorocarbons we've been putting into the atmosphere. So there are signs that it's, it's slowly shrinking in Antarctica. Although, I think it was last winter in the Arctic, there was a huge ozone hole. So that's a whole nother problem, uh, but much more easy to tackle. You basically got to get these different kind of aerosols out of commercial use, and, and, and that will help with that. Whereas global warming is like, you know, it's, it's so huge, it's, you can't imagine. So. And let's give you some uh, time to sign some books. Absolutely. Outside. It's been great having you here. You'll see that the Cary Institute is saving money on fossil fuels by the temperature of the room here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're doing our part. Uh, and uh, it, uh, you can see it warms my heart to see it only for me because it, you know, warming is part of the problem. But it's been great having you here uh, to tell us what's going on. I can see these great pictures of, of Benelli's. Uh, so many thanks. Thank you.